So hey, Mike. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Hey, so the first time that uh, we've gone, we go way back. Uh, but I remember the first time that I encountered you, probably face to face, was we were at camp meeting, and I was we were in this old rinky dink house, and oh, that's right, you were down below. Yeah, I was down below, right, and, right. and we had a newborn, and then we heard that you were on the second floor, so we were just like super like on eggs and sh- egg sh- is that the term eggshells, like we were hoping that we the baby wouldn't have woken you up, I and never heard of that. you were just super nice every morning. You'd come down super bright and sunny. And we're like, good morning. I'm like, hey, did the kid wake you up? And you're like, what? I have no yeah. idea. So, um, well, that was almost like 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. But I, I encountered your ministry and your your story even way before then. Uh, and I heard about Coming Out Ministries, right? And I just thought it was just the weirdest name. Uh, and, I, and, and I think you guys... I mean, you kind of did that intentionally. Sure. I mean, now you've worn out because everyone knows you guys' story and what you're right. trying to do. But, like, you know, why are you, are you promoting uh, alternative sexual lifestyles to be accepted in the Adventist church? Like, what? And this was, what, 10, 12? Again, I don't know my time frame. 12 years ago. 12 years ago. And the times then, it's this is going to sound cliche, but really different from from today, I would I would say. Um, the issue not being that prominent in the Adventist church. I never thought LGBT issues would be like a big issue as it is today, uh-huh. but it has become. Yeah? Yes, absolutely. When when uh, we began Coming Out Ministries, which was 12 years ago, okay, um, there were five individuals that got together and started the ministry. And we thought, you know, if one voice was good, that maybe five united would mm. actually be more powerful. So uh, when I came back into the church at 40 years old, which was 22 years ago, um, <laughs> I thought that I was the only one. I, I have to be the only person that would actually leave Adventism or leave Christianity and then go into the gay culture and then come out of it. Even my boyfriend at the time when I got baptized, he said, what, you're going to go back to the same church that you left? And so for the next 10 years, you know, that was a real journey of discovery, a journey mm. of understanding, uh, a journey of healing, uh, really the the healing along with understanding an intimate relationship with my Savior mm-hmm. has really been, I think, the most important part of that journey along that way. But when I met that there were other people that had come out of homosexuality into Christian culture, um, that really surprised me. Mm-hmm. So when we came together and decided on the name, I wasn't crazy about the name, but my <laughs> colleagues were. And the idea was when we went to um, a conference and we were standing there, we would just walk up to random people and they would see our sign that says Coming Out <laughs> Ministries. And we would say, do you know anyone who's gay? And they would go, oh, oh, no, no, no. And they would freak out. But then as they would talk to us and, and engage in conversations, then the walls came down and they realized mm. that this was a ministry that wanted to minister to people yeah. and to, you know, extend love. Our our design was to build a bridge between the the gay community and Christianity. But what we've found in the last 10 years um, is that really, I think the church needs our ministry more than the gay community mm-hmm. from the perspective of if we were to bring in LGBT people into the church now, there's a huge, um, a huge gap of of understanding uh, not only the mm-hmm. issue, but I think also about uh, prejudices that have been, you know, long rooted mm-hmm. in uh, Christianity that are off putting and don't create an environment that is uh, nurturing and loving mm-hmm. that points to our Savior. So it's been a discovery for us as well. But um, my colleague, he says, we're here to inspire, enlighten, and to equip the mm. church. And I think that if we do that first, then we've created an atmosphere where when the gay community does come knocking on our doors, that we have something to offer them that's not offensive Mm -hmm. or or puts them on the defense or makes them feel that they're rejected or othered. Mm. One of the contemporary so th- th- this is just such a like a like a huge 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 issue uh, all over society. It's all over the internet, um, and just just I mean we're going to talk about a lot of stuff and and but just on a personal just like, really appreciative of the courage that you guys have have shown, and not only being countercultural in society. Uh, and also in the church, in some, some, in, in a lot of respects, we've experienced it all. <laughs> <laughs> but just being, and 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 don't take this wrong, but being normal, nice people. <laughs> if, if, if I can use the normal in, in a nice, in, in, in a positive way. But what like, you say is you're really challenging kind of the 
kind of the Christian perspective on what a gay person is or, or what they come from. And, and we've had to address that, and mm. we, still, we address that every single day. I, I think that— um, I, when you said about being brave, you know, to come up with this issue, I, I would agree with you at first. The challenges are maybe a little bit different now, but we at least understand what the what the challenge is from the church perspective, but we also know what the challenge is from our perspectives because we were born that way. Mm, there right. was no way that we could change. We didn't want to change. You know, I spent my lifetime affirming and creating this identity that now I come into Christian culture that says that I have to give all of that up. Mm-hmm. So how is it that we can address not only the prejudices from the Christian community and yet at the same time minister to the needs of of people that have been ostracized that have mm-hmm. been you know marginalized by the church so that is a challenge and, and I think that our ministry has really had to adapt over the years thinking that oh yeah we're an ex-gay ministry no we're not you know mm-hmm. uh, revelation 184 says come out of her my people mm-hmm. so guess what Justin you can wear the shirt too we're all mm-hmm. coming out right? right 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 so um now now our ministry is inclusive to issues on abortion uh, premarital sex as well as um, uh, porn addiction and sexual addiction as well. Well, and that's the thing. I think what the, the ministry, although it has generally been f- uh, geared primarily for lesbian, gay uh, community, but there, w- I think I think what it has done is it has opened the conversation, at least in the Adventist church, uh, to talk about sexuality as part of our human, a human being, as as part of our being as human as humans, right? right? right. Um, it, 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 was, it was something that sexuality or your sexual identity was something that was just put off to the side that we really don't talk about. We talk about mental or spiritual or physical parts of your being, but your sexual, that's that's kind of a, a thing on the side. But it's definitely part of core of every single human being. And there are problems that emerge in, in living living in the modern culture and different different permutations and whatnot and how what does the bible have to say about all that and how do we navigate through all these yeah. issues so the core started to change back in the 1950s if you can believe it or not and there was a man <laughs> by the name of alfred kinsey who was a known homosexual pedophile masochist and this guy was financed by the rockefeller institute to do studies on human sexuality and it was from his studies that basically kind of created the whole lgbtq um acronym Mm. people identify by their sexual attractions rather than by the fact that god's identity was very clear in genesis chapter one that he made male and female so Mm. i think what happened is christianity basically held on to dogmatically that identity was between a male and a female which which i think is appropriate but what they didn't do is they weren't at least keeping aware of what was happening culturally Mm. it was changing not only in um in american society but all also around the world now um, and I think that that is really the crux of the matter is that uh, Christianity has really fallen behind, I think, on being harmless as doves, but yet wise as serpents. You know, it's important, I think, to hold on to the biblical identities, which have been long established for thousands of years. But now what's happening is we have to be aware of what's going on in culture so that we don't compromise mm-hmm. the biblical truth while we're meeting the needs of the community. Mm-hmm. So there's so many uh, topics, and so we'll get into all these things, but there's so many we can, we have so many topics we can go into. Um, I want to establish first, though, I mean, we're dealing with, at least within Adventism, right? Uh, we have some people that are, that are saying, hey, the church is like 50 years behind. We need to fully, um, uh, no holds barred, uh, you just accept, acknowledge, uh, embrace, and then you find more ways and, and uh, of, of, of just, we're, we're just th- we're totally behind. And there's others that say, hey, there are some countries in the world that homosexuality is illegal and you just round them and kill them, kill them off and get them out of the church, right? Yeah. I mean, we're dealing with this kind of range of ideas, and those are the kind of the extremes. And uh, also on top of that, we're, there's a lot of terms that are just constantly changing. Uh, we got gender and sexual orientation and attraction and self-identity and 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 my understanding is now that homosexuality even that term is is not the preferred term then you have the the, the acronyms and, and whatnot so can you give us some guidance yeah. on, uh, on 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 what we're trying to do is is to start the conversation mm-hmm. and, and 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 come up with some 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 um, some solid pillars from scripture from uh, from from common places where we can get conversation going. Well, I want to kind of go back a little bit to what you started with, okay. and 
you know, <clears throat> it's interesting because there were there was this one position that when I was 20 years old, when I walked away from church culture, um, I remember being an Adventist from the time I was 15, struggling with uh, gender identity. I thought that I was a girl trapped in a boy's body until I was 20. Mm. And that was probably my very first conscious thought was that I had rejected my masculine um, um, biology and that for those 20 years, the first 20 years of my life, I thought that I was a girl. And even as a Christian, I thought that the only way that God would accept me with same-sex attraction, which didn't come on until I was 13, um, in my mind, the only resolution that I could have to that and still be a Christian was that I had to have a sex change so that God would be okay with my mm-hmm. attractions. Mm-hmm. All of that was completely messed up, and we'll address that later. But what I want to get to is that at 20 years old, when I walked out of the church culture, the only thing I ever heard was that gays can't change and that God hates them. Mm-hmm. And that message I got loud and clear, even though there weren't uh, sermons from the pulpit. But what I would hear is I would hear church members saying, well, at least I'm not like him. Or, you know, we know that gays are, are going to burn in a hotter hell. I, you know, you would hear these subtle things, or maybe not so subtle, mm-hmm. but because people didn't know what I was struggling with. They they were cavalier about saying these statements that really gave me absolutely no hope. And I remember, I remember at 20 years old, I had met a lesbian that was struggling with the same thing I was. Uh, we had both grown up in Adventist culture, and here we were sharing our secret with each other. And we determined once and for all we were going to go back to the Adventist church, and we were going to find out, does the Adventist church really have the answer for people like us? Hmm. And I remember I handpicked this one guy, and he was an elder in the church, and he'd come from a sexual you know, past where he'd been promiscuous or whatever, and he seemed solid, he seemed spiritual, and so finally I got the nerve up to ask him, and I said, hey, Steve, you know, can I talk to you? He said, sure, Mike, what's up? And I said, well, it's about women. And before I could say another word, he interrupted me, and he said something really vile about women, and I knew that he wasn't safe. I knew that there was no way I was going to tell him what I was struggling with. Hmm. But I listened to him, and when he was done— I thanked him for his time, but I walked out of church that night and I said to God, if that's the best you've got, I'm done. I'm out of here. I can't get my religion and my sexuality to come together. I've been praying for years, struggling not only with gender confusion, but now, you know, same-sex attraction. So that was it. It made it very easy for me to walk out of church culture. And, Mm. you know, nobody was running saying, hey, Mike, where are you? Hey, we miss you. Hey, can we talk to you? So the church made it very easy for me to walk away. As a matter of fact, I have an interesting story. It wasn't long (laughs) after I came out, and here I am in a gay bar on a Friday night. And as I'm sitting at the bar, I had my drink, and a gentleman beside me had his drink. And another guy walks up to the bar, and he says to the bartender, hey, happy Sabbath. And I looked at this guy, and then the guy beside me also chimed in. He goes, oh, yeah, happy Sabbath. So, of course, I jump into the conversation. (laughs) All four of us, including the bartender, were ex-Seventh-day Adventists. And the only place— that we had the ability to share a happy Sabbath was in a gay bar because we shared our stories. Some of us had been uh, beaten up by families or kicked out of the home or rejected by the church. And you know what? Again, even apathy, even the inability to address a situation is still a form of rejection. And mm-hmm. you know what? We sat there that night sharing about our history, how we'd walked out of you know Christian culture, Adventist culture, mm-hmm. into you know, the gay culture, because they basically didn't have any room for us. Mm-hmm. And and that, to me, I still think is prevalent in our culture or in Christianity or Adventism. But now what's happened is now that there's this new movement that's come in and coming out ministries has had to address this as well, because the it's hate— kind of flipped. The, oh, it's, no, it's not even flipped. They're both alive and well, oh, okay, okay, is okay. what we found. Okay, okay. So you either get one or the other, and some churches, I get both. But of the younger generation, I would say they experience one side more and the older generation, probably what you described earlier. Right, yeah? right. Okay. Right, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, um, I- I'm just going to kind of lay it out here. Yeah. But when Coming Out Ministries first started, we approached the leadership in the church and we begged them, you know, please, there's a movie coming out that's basically, you know, pro-gay in Adventism. And we said, we need to put out something. We need to come together. We need to really address this. And the answer that we got from the leadership is it takes a lot to turn a cruise ship, you know, Mm. whereas, you know, a small boat can turn very easily. And they basically poo-pooed the idea and said, oh, you know, we think that we're okay. We think that we can handle it. And here we are, what, 12 years later. And that the effect of that movie in our church culture, um, there was a statistic that was done, and it was about six years ago uh, during the fall council. And the, the statistic was that 
49% of our Adventist youth think that gay marriage is okay. Mm. And that's the power of what that simple movie and and this conversation is done because there wasn't another conversation going on. So mm-hmm. the only thing that we were hearing was this promotion. So so before, remember, there was this position that God hates gays and gays can't change, right? So now what we have is that we have this new position that, that gays still can't change, but God loves them. And that if you tell a gay person that they can change, mm. and that's hate speech, and that that's rejection and, and prejudice. So it's interesting because that in First Corinthians chapter six, it talks about all the abominations that won't be in heaven, and of course, homosexual practice is there. And, and and let me be clear, because this was a really important point for me. When I came into Christianity, I thought that God just hated all gays, and I thought that He'd wave this magic wand and poof, He'd just take it all away from me, and I'd be married with kids. I didn't understand the process, and I think that we as um, as Christians we misrepresent that process. That you know what. Haman had to dip into the river seven times before he was healed. (laughs) You know, Mary Magdalene had to be healed seven times from demons. Mm. So it isn't necessarily an event of healing. It's a process to Mm -hmm. healing. And that's what I've, you know, experienced, I I would say, in my 22 years of, of walking with Jesus Christ now. But the problem is that when we look at verses 9 and 10 in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it talks about the list of all the abominations that won't mm-hmm. be in heaven, but it's the Christian church, I think, that has done more for the for the gay rights than anybody else because we have said for so long that this is the group that God hates and that there's no hope for those, those people. And so the gay community eventually said, all right, so if we're unchangeable, if we can't be changed, then we want our rights, we want the right to marry. And I believe that the, hmm. this this negative... Um, isolation of that community from First Corinthians has been the promotion of of what the gay community now stands on their their policies for. So so now what's happening? Is- so uh, hey, but I just I got so I will just to recap. I yeah. love what you're saying. Your analysis is saying, is is that society's understanding of the gospel hasn't changed. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No, well it it that, has that misunderstanding that, it, that 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 you can't change. It did change, but they kept. The premise. Does that make sense? Because over here, God hated them, and over here, God loves them, but the message stayed the same. Yeah. And, and so if if gays can't change, then that basically throws out verse 11. Mm. And, and, and I want to go back just a minute because it's not just homosexuality that's listed in 9 and 10. Mm-hmm. It talks mm-hmm. about adulterers. It right. talks about fornicators. Right. It talks about porn addicts, you know, people that have mm-hmm. premarital sex, you know, whatever that is. It even includes gossips, mm-hmm. you know, slanderers. So a gossiper mm-hmm. is in the same group as, you know, as somebody that is homosexual. So there's no hierarchy of sinner. Thank you. Yeah. But the Christian church made Has a made hierarchy so. of sin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so what's happened now is the gay community or the gay Christian group, they basically, again, isolated that one group out of verses 9 and 10, and they say God loves them and that they can't change. Therefore, what that does is that cuts off that community from verse 11, which isn't love. It's not a message of love because verse 11 says, such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And so when I look in verse 11, that isn't something that I can do. That is something that only Jesus Christ can do. Mm. And what that does is that negates everything that Jesus did on the cross if I accept that God loves me as I am and that I can't change. Mm -hmm. So that isn't biblical. Both positions are wrong. Mm -hmm. Verse 11 is very clear that I can change, but I can't change myself. As a matter of fact, in my presentations, I say, God didn't say stop being gay. Because he knew I couldn't. Mm -hmm. There was no way that I could change my attractions and the history and the memory that I'd indulged in for those 40 years. But he said, if you'll stop resisting me, I have for you everything that my son did on that cross so that you could have access to the healing and the restoration. If you'll just accept what sin is by the definition in Mm -hmm. Jeremiah, it says, only acknowledge your iniquities. But if I make my iniquity okay with God, then I have nothing to confess. Mm. Therefore, I've cut people off from that process of cleansing of what Jesus did on the cross so that I can be justified by his blood and sanctified in that process of the cleansing. I love that the, the if we can just zoom out that you know the, the lar- there's one large question that people have is like why is the church so involved uh, why do they care who I sleep with why do they why are they just so in my my person personal business and what you're talking about is the church isn't isn't necessarily getting into private affairs but it's talking about the nature of the gospel message right and this is where current the society and the gospel have an intersection point in on this issue. Mm-hmm. 
so thank you, Justin, because this is really turned into something that I really feel, you know, so many people will ask us during our Q&As or our presentations, they'll say, you know, so how do I help my gay neighbor? Mm -hmm. You know, how do I help my, my gay sister? And, you know, our comment to them is like, well, are they a Christian? And many times, or most of the times, they'll say, well, no. I go, well, then it doesn't matter. Right. It, it, the problem isn't that they're gay. The problem is that they need to know Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So there's no protocol for the gay person, a protocol for the drug addict, or protocol for the gossip. It's all the same. So why is it that Christianity is so focused on who somebody's sleeping with or how they identify when really we can put all of that aside and we can put our focus back on Jesus Christ? And you know what? I think that we'll find a lot of commonality in that, and I really despise the condescension that's in Christianity, is that we look at the homosexual, we say, oh, you poor homosexual, maybe God will have mercy on you, when really, if we would just get down on the same level, as it says in Ministry of Healing, page 143, it says, Christ's method alone brought lasting results. What did he do? He met people where they were. Mm. And so instead of this condescending attitude that we have, what if we got on their same level and said, listen, I don't understand what you're going through, but I'm going through something of my own. But Jesus says that he has a promise and the healing for both of us. And so if we put our focus on him, he promises to help both of us out. Whether we've been a Christian for 40 years or 15 minutes, I think that what what the gay community is desperately in need of, of of knowing that they're that they're normal, that that your attractions may be different than my attractions, but that God has the answer for all of our attractions. Interesting. A friend of mine, hmm. uh, we were actually cutting firewood, and he's this really macho guy, and he and he had that very negative attitude about gay people. But as he was forced to spend the day with me, um, at the end of the day, I, I shared with him, I said, you know, this has really been a masculine moment for me as a hairdresser for 30 years. You know, here I am chopping wood with this guy. And he said, you know what? He said, Mike, you've taught me something, too. And I was kind of surprised by that. And he said, you know what? I never struggled with what you struggle with, but I struggle with sexuality. I struggle with, you know, attractions outside of my wife and, and things like that. And he said, your attractions may be different than mine, but we struggle with the same thing. Same and problem. that's lust. That's right. And you know what? That was a revelation for him and for me mm -hmm. because what he did is he put me in the same category with him. And we recognize that we were both sinners in need of a Savior. So the answer to the gay issue isn't to elevate it and say that it's okay, because that's not love. You've cut them off from the transforming power of Jesus Christ. But also, we don't want to condemn them and say that they're worse than anybody else. We're all in this together. So in encountering uh, family members or friends who have same-sex uh, attraction, you're saying vulnerability mm -hmm. is, is, is one modality that helps. Yeah, but you know what? Vulnerability comes with a great risk, and I don't think that the church is even ready for that. And I understand many people when they say, I would never admit to a church that I have same-sex attraction. And here's the point that I want to make on that, is that I was in um, South America just a couple of weeks ago, and a gentleman came forward, and in Hispanic culture, it's very negative to be LGBT. But in private, this person who is still involved in his church, who is still struggling with same-sex attraction and behaviors— he came up to me and he said, the one thing that I really need is I need somebody to listen to me. And, you know, that was interesting because I, I think a lot of times we as good-hearted Christians that we think, oh, I got the answer for you and, you know, whatever you're struggling with, here, you know, do this, 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 and this, when really what people need is they need to know that they're loved, they need to know that they're understood, they need to know that they mattered. And when they, when they experience that, then I think— they're ready to receive the gospel, but not according to my ethics and my timetable, but according to the Holy Spirit's timetable. I love this is uh, not only theological and, and, and up here, but it's very practical, right? Because there's a lot of Adventists who, if they're not struggling with uh, a homosexuality per se, they are struggling on how to interact with people who have come out or loved ones or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the distance inside where, like, on one side, we want to be like New Testament Jesus, the hippie Jesus that's loving and caring and peace and goodwill toward men. Mm -hmm. But then you got the Old Testament that's, you know, and I know that's a, a fake economy but that's a, it's, it's a thing where you know it's a sin so this must be uh, ostracized from society how can what are some practical tools uh that that you can give to adventists uh and 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 help even uh, resolve that dissonance inside them inside them 
I have a perfect example um, that I'm always excited to share, and it's a personal one. When I first came into the church, I was a hairdresser for television people. I had a condo on a lake. I had a house with a pool. I had a convertible Mercedes, blah, blah, blah. I had it all. And then there was this friend of mine who was also coming out of the gay culture. He was about 29 years old. He was Puerto Rican. And so he met this family at church that were Colombian, and they were immigrants, and they had nothing. You know, the father was a house painter. The mother stood home, and she homeschooled her, her 12-year-old daughter. And and yet they invited my friend Ruben to come for Bible studies, and he went. So my friend Ruben calls me on the phone. I'm a new Adventist, uh, newly out of my relationship. And he says, hey, there's this Bible study on Sunday night. You should come. And I thought to myself, uh, you know, I've been in church all day Saturday. I don't <laughs> think so. And he said, well, they feed us. And I said, okay, I'm in. So every Sunday night, Justin, I was at their house eating their food. You know, we would have a Bible study, but— but they saw it as something so much more. I think that a lot of times we as Christianities, we do our little checklist like Bible study with the gay, right? Or a Bible study with whatever, and that we've done our job. But this family, you know, they brought us into their humble home, which was in a really bad neighborhood. And, you know, they fed us everything that they had. Not only did we study the Word of God, but then we played games. And, you know, we became more connected. It wasn't just a Bible study, and then they sent us home. It was interesting to me because it took several months, and then they had actually three of us. There were three of us. Another friend of mine um, who was this big black guy with big muscles and then this skinny Puerto Rican guy and then me, the hairdresser. So I don't know how anyone could have missed that we were three gays, right? And every week we would go to a different church, and I'm sure people would say, "Uh uh-oh, they're back. But one night after our Bible study, uh, Gladys said to her husband, Ezekiel, she said, do you think they're gay? And honestly, Justin, I don't know how they missed it. But- But he said, he goes, I don't know. How would I know? And she said, should we be concerned about our daughter? And he said the most amazing thing. He said, the same blood that was shed for us was shed for them. He said, it shouldn't matter. And then she said, I'm so glad that you said that because I've really learned to love them. Mm. And, you know, that in itself would be a really good thing. But, you know, our relationship has moved on. When 9-11 happened, we were convicted that we needed to get out of the city. I had nothing in common with this Colombian family that were immigrants, and they had nothing in common with me. But because of our Bible studies, because of this friendship that God had created through the Word, you know, when I moved to Tennessee, they moved with me. And you know what? They stayed with me until they found their house. Four years ago, I sold my house, and so they designated a room in their house for me whenever I'm in town. And that that 12-year-old girl, she grew up, and she met a boy when she was in university, and he wanted to marry her. And she said to him, because of the relationship that we had formed, you know, during that time, she said, if you want to marry me, you have to ask my father and Mike Carducci for permission. (laughs) I mean, that blew me away that that God was creating mm. families within, you know, the church that that were were beautiful and what I needed. And they didn't know what they were providing for me, but they were surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And as they were surrendered to the Holy Spirit, they didn't have to understand what I came from. They didn't have to experience that to know how to help me. But as they were loving me and creating that relationship, that in itself was even healing for me as I was feeling like I belonged and that I was part of something. And what was really amazing is um, that young girl grew up and and she did get married to that young man. With your permission. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. That's right. I did give my permission. And they have two children that call me uncle. They call Mm -hmm. me Tio, you know, Mm -hmm. Tio Michael. So what's so beautiful is that I think that we miss opportunities because we're so focused on someone's behavior that we miss the fact that these are children of God. Mm -hmm. Jesus' blood was shed for that person. And so, you know what? I want to share with them the gospel, not because of what they've come from, but because, you know, if God shed his blood for them, they should know the good news too. And that was a really powerful lesson for me. What what about scenarios where they're family members Mm -hmm. that, you know, these are... They're coming from loving perspective, lo- loving relationships, and um, because they've come out, it's broken that relationship. Or you know, I don't. I'm, I'm sure you. Well, even cultures can break relationships, and and I have an example. There was um, there was about five couples that that called um, a, a colleague of mine and I to come and basically help them. They said, you know, educate us because where they lived in Europe that their church was basically promoting the LGBT acceptance and and they they knew that that wasn't biblical but yet they wanted to reach out they wanted to minister to their children and so I went there with a colleague and we spent a few weeks and during that time basically 
what I did, there was a couple that was Jamaican and, you know, in Jamaican culture, it's a very negative thing. And when they found out that the daughter was gay, you know, there was a lot of um, uh, condemnation that they felt mm-hmm. themselves, mm-hmm. a lot of um, shame. You know, shame. That's mm-hmm. right. And parents experience a greater shame than anybody yes. else. I've had parents come up to me privately so afraid that even if they saw somebody talking to me, if mm-hmm. they saw them talking to me, that they would automatically assume that. Mm-hmm. And and these parents, they wanted to know how they could minister to their daughter. And as I came there, they came away with this this thing that the comment that they said is that, oh, we thought that you were going to tell us how to minister to our daughter, but really, instead, you really disciplined and ministered to us. You really showed us that there were many things that we weren't doing Hmm. that were driving our daughter even further away. And the things that I really communicated to them was that really you have to change your relationship. And from a parent's perspective, Justin, and of course you know this, you have small children, is for the first 15 years of their life, you know, you're telling them, you know, don't put your towel on the floor, you know, go to bed, you know, eat your carrots, you know, whatever. And so as a disciplinarian or as the parent of that child, you know, you're used to saying things and your kids respond. But then what happens is after the age of about 12 to 15, you are no longer that sole influencer over your children. Mm -hmm. And what was happening is a lot of parents, most parents that I talk to, they haven't learned to switch that that attitude of going from the parental authority to to the parent that's also a friend that helps their child to reason. And I think that this is one of the biggest mm. ways that we let down people is that we don't give them the right to choose, that we don't listen to what's on their heart, or we don't encourage them and, and say, hey, how are you feeling? What are your thoughts about that? Because we're so afraid that if they step outside of the of the boundaries of what God's well, Word We're said, in protection mode. That's right. And, and, that's and right. we got to grow beyond protection mode, you're saying. But you're not protecting them mm. when you hide them in a closet until mm-hmm. they're 21 years old. Mm-hmm. And it has an application for the Internet as well as phone use, as well as their friends. And, of course, you have a responsibility, a moral responsibility mm-hmm. to help guide your children. But I think that what we really lose is those precious opportunities to really get inside your kid's head. It's one thing if I have a one-way dialogue with you and I tell you what you need to do so that you can have a happy life or that you can make it to heaven. But have I really given you the opportunity to experience your own religion Hmm. if I haven't asked you, how do you feel about the Sabbath? How do you feel about dress reform? How do you feel about the diet? You know, and, and to help them to know that they're listened to and that they matter. Because a lot of times I think our youth are leaving not because of the food or because of the music, (laughs) but because they felt dismissed or they felt Mm -hmm. that they weren't heard. And I hear that from so many young people. I experienced it myself. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to these these parents, I really say, listen, it's time to back up. They're not a child anymore. You're you're talking about 18, 19, 20-year-old young people. And so you can't sit there and lord over them anymore. Now you have to draw them. And I love that. Steps to Christ says that Jesus doesn't drive he draws. Mm. And so now it's different. Now you have to respect your children's right to choose, and that can be very difficult. And how do you balance that? How can I respect my children's um, you know, position to go into the gay culture when I know that it's you know, only going to bring death and destruction, but at the same time love them in a way that compels them to get to know Jesus again? Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is a really difficult position for every parent. But as we were talking with these parents, we really told them, back off, you know, and and we really challenge some of their, their thinking into thinking that, you know, if your child is gay, that you have to cut them off completely financially, emotionally, and say, I'm not going to talk to you until mm. you come to your senses, when really you've lost opportunities to let them know that they are loved. It's not my job to save you, Justin. It's my job to show you who Jesus Christ is. Mm-hmm. And as parents, I think that we get kind of sidelined with that and think that if we say the right thing at the right time, that it's going to make a difference in their life when really the Bible is very clear. Lean not into your own understanding, but acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. So what happens is a lot of times parents will put these digs in or they'll say things that will only draw their kids further away from them. You know, where the kids cut them off, they have no no more communication with them and they're moving on with their lives. And then the parent, you know, wonders what happened when really it has a lot to do, I think, with communication. Mm-hmm. It's not just telling your kid to observe the Sabbath or, you know, to eat your carrots. It's really about understanding them and giving them an opportunity to know what it's like to experience a real relationship with Jesus. See them as human beings. They see them, see them as young yeah. adults, yeah. adults. Mm-hmm. See them as, as, 
as uh, not just uh, things to take care of, but the unique individuals that God has created. Yeah. I mean, you sound like a youth pastor. I mean, this is all, this is golden stuff. I mean, th- these are principles of youth ministry that are, that are, that are timeless. Yeah. Well, you know, I just listen to everybody's story <laughs> and I've heard so many stories, but there's some that have really impressed me. Mm. There's some that, that I could even see my own personal application to. There was one time this, uh, we were speaking, we we're doing a Q and A for the pastor's wives at a, um, at a camp meeting. Mm-hmm. And so one of the women came forward and she was ahead of this group of women and she came up to us and they were like, four of us that were there at the Q&A and she looked at us and she says I understand exactly everything that you've been through and we're looking at this very conservative woman huh. and we're thinking lady you don't have a clue <laughs> and she started to talk about the next thing she said is she said you know I've always had this fascination as a little girl that I wanted to see a man naked and you know I kind of jerked my head a little bit and she said yes and I went to my mother and I said mother I want to see a naked man And her mother didn't freak out and she didn't say, oh, that's shameful and it's hideous for you to have those thoughts. Instead, what she did is she heard her daughter and she answered the question. She said, well, they have more um, hair than we do. They have more muscles than we do. And she said, I don't really have a naked man to show you. I guess we could ask your father. And the little girl says, no, 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 I don't want to see father. But she gave her the truth. She didn't shame her. She listened to her. She didn't shut down the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. She knew the daughter knew that she had an open line of communication to her mother no matter what she was going through, that she was able to talk about any issue without being, mm. like you said, shut down. So years went by. They were doing a, a church event where they were cleaning out a house that had been abandoned. And she opened up a cupboard door, and there was a poster of a naked man. And she ripped that poster off, and she you know, hid it from her brothers and sisters. But what did she do with it? She went straight to her mother, and she goes, Look, mother, a naked man. And again, you know, I would be shocked by that, but the mother didn't freak out, and she said, well, you've always wanted to see a naked man. There he is. And then she pointed out everything that she had said before. Doesn't he have more hair than we do? Doesn't he have more muscles than we do? And when she affirmed all of the biological differences, she did the one thing that made my colleagues and I cry. Is She then said to the little girl, she goes, but look at his face. What's he doing? And she said, well, he's smiling, mother. And she said, what do you think he's smiling at? I don't know. Do you think he loves Jesus? I don't know. Do you think he's a Christian? Do you think he's married? And that was the most amazing thing is she took the focus off of the physical and she went to the spiritual Mm. while she's looking at a poster of a naked man. Mm. And that was when I realized I was that four-year-old kid. I was that 10-year-old kid. I was that 15-year-old kid that could never go to my parents and tell them, I feel like I'm a girl trapped in a boy's body. I didn't have anyone in my life that I could go to and say, I'm having same-sex attraction. Can you help me? I struggled with that Mm. on my own. I suffered with that because I didn't have a place where I felt safe to share those things that I was going through. Mm. And that I think is so valuable for every parent is to keep that line of communication open with your children so they don't hear you make comments that are that are off-putting that make them think, oh, I can never share that with my mom or my dad. Because we don't know what our precious young children are going through, especially in this world that is just absolutely saturated with sexuality and identity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, man, there's so many, there's so many thoughts going through my mind. Um. Yeah, that's that's just that's 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 awesome. It's 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 a challenge uh, to parents and their par- their their the parental spirituality. What most parents say to me after they've been involved in our prayer line, we have a prayer line that we've set up over ten years ago for parents to come to find community, to find a voice that will will listen to them and understand exactly what they're going through because. There's a lot of people in the church that would never understand what a parent is going through. Do I go to my child's gay wedding? You know, how do I hold up the biblical standard and at the same time love my children? So we've created a community where parents can come and get that. And and not everybody agrees with everybody in the group, but they have the right to be there mm. and they have something in common. And there's a lot of respect that I think that they're, they're able to share there. Um, but in that process of understanding that, these parents come to me and they said, I thought that I had a faith in God. And they said, it wasn't until this issue came through my son or my daughter that I realized I have no faith at all. And that what they've learned in this process, as a matter of fact, that 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 couple from Europe, that was what they said, is that it challenged everything. And what the mother had to do is she really had to pull back. And instead of saying what she felt, she said, I'm not going to say anything at all. And what she did in that process is she was focused on demonstrating her love for her daughter. And you know what? She was... She was not going to affirm her lifestyle, but she was at least going to accept it. And instead of acting like there was 
this silence or this distance between her. Instead, she made herself available emotionally. She affirmed her daughter whenever she could. I love you. You're beautiful to me. You'll always be precious to me. And those are words of affirmation that say, even if you identify as non-binary, even if you identify as the opposite sex or whatever, there are ways that we can avoid pronouns or ways that we can avoid hot button topics in a way that we can still reach our children Mm -hmm. by just loving them and letting them know that they're loved. Mm -hmm. And that I think is a challenge for many people. You know, because we want to say the right thing. But but when this parent chose not to say anything, and what she did is she she had it out with God. She was the one that was on her knees. Lord, I don't understand this. Mm. How can I reach her? You have to reach her. And holding God accountable for his promises, I think, is so powerful for parents when they finally start getting angry at God and they start telling him, I need you to hold on to your word. I need you to answer the prayers that you've prayed, that you will return the hearts of the fathers to their sons mm-hmm. and, their, and the daughters to their mothers. You know, and as they do this, they start to realize that they were doing their Christian um They were doing their own Christianity according to their own designs rather than really looking to God as the one that had the power to change lives. Hmm. And when that happened, then the parents really start backing off. They take away the pressure from these kids. The kids start to be confounded. It's like, why aren't they hating me? Why aren't they judging me? Why aren't they yelling at me? And instead, when they demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ that is joyful, that is peaceful. So when a parent is crying over their their gay kid, oh, please, please, you know, you're not going to go to heaven if this is how you live. That doesn't draw anybody to Jesus Christ, but when a confident parent who is putting their tears, you know, in in the bottle that God himself is holding, and they cry out to Jesus about reaching their daughter or their son, then they have the confidence to come to their daughter or their son and to be totally confident and to see their child as what they can become rather than what they are. And you know what? Mm. That's when they say, I really challenged how I even saw God myself. Any, any, um... Any any counsel, Mike, on on the nuance? You've been talking a lot, a lot about kids, and I think this is all this is gold. This is golden counsel. Uh, we're seeing also a lot of cases where where kids are seeing their parents mm-hmm. come out of the closet yeah. after 40, 50 years of marriage, and dad is now in an alternate lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would assume same same counsel, but any nuance or any anything else that you can. Add, well, you I know? think it is different, Justin, because now it really confounds the thinking of a child. I know that they've done studies on children that have come from transgender parents. You know, say, um, well, there's a, a case that I'm thinking of where these two little boys had a father that was transgender, and he eventually had the sex change. So now the mother and the father are living in separate bedrooms, mm-hmm. and they're no longer having a relationship, but they're raising these two boys. And so, you know, the the LGBT community would say, oh, now they have two mothers, but don't those boys need a father? Mm. And so now these two boys are really confused about their own gender identity. You know, is it something that's fluid that can change? Am I going to change? And with the limited studies that they've done on those children of transgender parents is that they found that there's a lot of drug addiction. There's a lot of um, listlessness that they don't have direction. They can't hold a job. They find a lot of depression and drug abuse, you know, that is among this population. So we know that scientifically that there are effects on the children that come mm. from these homes. Um, there have been many times that I've had uh, young people come up to me and say that my grandfather came out as gay or, you know, this parent came out as gay. And, you know, the reactions have been in the extreme. Rejection, acceptance, you know, um, and there's a lot of emotions that are tied to that. Mm-hmm. So there isn't really a pat answer for that. Mm-hmm. And I think that everybody's experience is, is different. But I think, again, in leadership and 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 I think that what that child is really fearing is my parent going to be ostracized am I going to be ostracized so again we need to come at it with the same approach that you know how can I help you I really don't understand that I I may not be able to sympathize with you because I haven't gone through that but I can empathize and I can sit there and I can listen to you as a matter of fact the power of listening is so strong There was a transgender um, female, which means that they're biologically male. And um, they were in Europe, and I was um, speaking at their church. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, I got this. You know, I understand what it's like to struggle with identity issues. But when I got in front of this person, it was somebody was like six foot five. And he had very strong masculine features. And even though he'd had the top and the bottom surgeries, he did not make a very convincing female. And as I looked at this person that was just towering over me, Mm. I remember thinking that there's nothing I have that's going to benefit this guy. 
And you know what? The only thing that the Lord impressed me to do was to just sit quietly with him because his wife left him. Mm. His children wouldn't speak to him. The church didn't know how to deal with them. And so this man would come to church every Sabbath and sit by himself. And because nobody knew how to deal with him, they left him even more lonely and more ostracized mm-hmm. than ever. And you know what I did the whole day? I just sat with him. And listened. And I listened to him. Mm. And there was nothing that I had to say that was going to make any more value than the power of listening to him and letting him know that, hey, I'm here for you. Mm. And I'm going to be there to listen to whatever you have to say. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to reject you. Mm. And you know what? It was so beautiful because now what was changing for me is that I'm starting to realize that that the Holy Spirit knows exactly how to do his job. And I don't have to do that. And what's so beautiful is I don't have an I don't have to have an agenda with you, Justin, of what I'm going to address and how I'm going to drag you in kicking and screaming into the baptismal. Instead, as I love you and empathize with you and try to understand, then the gospel is very simple. As a matter of fact, thank you for that. It was either from you or the Holy Spirit uh, through your line of questioning or for his impression. But um, I, I was talking to you earlier about this uh, this event that we had in, in South America. And so um, there was a young girl, mm-hmm. and the very first words out of her mouth is she says, I'm a lesbian. And I said, okay, I get that. Well, I think that she was a little, you know, confrontive with me because she expected that she was just, you know, that I was expecting of her to just give up her identity. And I didn't do that. I didn't go there with her. And that's a choice that only she can make. But my job is really to create an atmosphere where she can find a connection to the Holy Spirit, where she Mm. can find a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not my job to convert it. It's his. And so I, I see that much more clearly now. And so I can easily love her. And every time that I spoke to her, after every presentation that I was giving, first words out of her mouth, but I'm a lesbian. I go, okay, you're a lesbian. I get it. So I invited her to come to lunch with me up at the house instead of, you know, standing in the cafeteria line. And my colleague had also invited this trans female, which is somebody biologically male. And we're having this nice lunch. They know that I struggle with transgenderism and also homosexuality. And and while we're sitting there, the, the trans female is saying, if I could just have the surgeries, if I, if I could just become a woman, you know, everything would be fine. And then the young girl saying, well, if I could just find a relationship with the right woman, you know, my life would be great. And just then what hit me was so beautiful. It was Matthew 6, 33. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God mm. and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. And so I looked at this, you know, this this transgender female, and I said, listen, I said, it's not about that. I said, Matthew 6, 33 says, seek ye first, you know, the kingdom of God, right, and his righteousness. And then I looked at this young woman. I said, it's not about a girlfriend. It's not about your parts and pieces. It's about seeking first Jesus Christ and his righteousness, and then everything will be satisfied. Mm-hmm. You'll have your peace. You'll find your happiness. You'll find everything that you're that you're needing. And so how beautiful that when we're confronted by this, and I think that this is where the church really loses a lot of ground, is that we get so focused on identity and sexuality that the focus should really be about mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. It's like, wait a minute, don't even worry about that. Don't be so concerned about the life that they're living or their sexuality and identity. God can handle that. But if we do our part and if we put the focus back on Jesus Christ and seeking his righteousness, everything falls right into place. That young woman came on the last night and she gave a testimony to about 400 people in this pavilion about how she was walking out of her gay identity, even though she was affirmed by her business, mm. you know, being a lawyer in a in a government office and 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 how she was walking out of this identity and walking away from the church that was affirming her as a leader, as a lesbian. And, you know, then a young man came up to me that was also struggling with same-sex attraction and ready to just go out into the gay life. He says, I've been struggling with this so, for so long. Um, I was molested as a young kid. I've been experimenting, you know, and all of this. And he came forward and said, because of what she said, I want to give my testimony. So the next morning he came forward and we prayed over him and we loved him. And it was amazing. Even the transgender female that Sunday night after this woman gave her testimony before she headed back to her um, to her country, this young man was crying. And he said, but I'm but I want to be a female. I want to be a woman. And I said, you know what? God will take care of that. God will deal with that. And I didn't have to focus on that. I didn't have to say anything about Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. You know what? I was there to point into Jesus Christ. And as he embraces Jesus Christ, all of that stuff will be addressed. 
I'm, I'm hearing your stories, Mike, and I'm, I'm t- I was writing something down while you were talking, and, and two takeaways that I got, mm-hmm. and, and I want to confirm if I'm on the right track here, right? So one, um, I'm really seeing a um, a a a, a uh, how do I how do I how do I say this the right way? So uh, 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 an imperviousness in in the reaction to the individual. Uh, let me put it differently. Because you're, you're, yeah, thank you. Impervious <laughs> is a big word yeah, for me. Yeah. Um, so not reacting uh, to 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 their their to not to not judge to not have a shock value. Um, is that such a difficult Christian principle? Are we I told think not it to is. judge? I think it is because we tend to mimic what culture tells us to react. I mean, we 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 do what culture tells us to. So yeah. if someone says, "Hey, I'm trans," like what, right? Or the current or the current generation is to completely affirm and say, "Hey, that's the coolest thing ever," right? Mm-hmm. But we our, our our initial reaction is 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 something that's is a very powerful entry point to the conversation. That's number one for me that, that I come up with. And number two is you you often talk a lot about redirection, mm-hmm. right? So we want to get into the issue and hey, what's your behavior and and what, what's going through your mind? But but what you're saying is you just redirect to the Holy Spirit. You just redirect to God. It's the expectation and 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 here's a point that we were talking about earlier. Also, we as Christians, we we already have a pre-assumed um, mentality, and, and some of it's true, is that we are so focused on that behavior that that becomes our our. Um, we get obsession. so focused and punctiliar towards that one little thing. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When when really the bigger issue is, do you know Jesus? Mm. And unless you know Jesus, none of it matters anyway. Mm-hmm. It's not an issue. So I think that in Christianity recognizing that there is a whole soup du jour of things out there that the devil is putting in front of us to draw us away. So when we as Christians, when we when we can't see beyond that, we also don't see them as the whole picture of how Jesus sees. Remember, Jesus doesn't see us as we are. He sees us as what we can become. Mm-hmm. So if we could take out the judgment long enough to see that person as a child of God whose, whose blood was shed for him, then I think that that would automatically change like, ah, God can handle that. And you know what? What confidence when a Christian who doesn't pine about your sexuality can say, ah, God can handle that. He's got that. Don't worry. You know, that automatically, I think, draws me into this thing like, wow, I really appreciate the confidence of that Christian to not focus on this behavior, but rather focus on my Savior who's got the power and the strength to get me past that. And I love the confidence of a Christian that says that God's going to fix all of that for you. Mm. Can homosexuals change? Everybody can change. You know, it talks about it in 1 Corinthians 6. And it's interesting because, you know, forgive me for pointing this out, but Justin, you know, that's the end-all question. Can gays change? Well, in in 1 Corinthians 6, everybody gets to change. The fornicator can change. Mm. The adulterer can change. The gossiper can change. The murderer can change. So in other words, stop calling out homosexuals anyway. But isolating something that God has clearly said that, but you've been changed. Why? Why is that um, such a such a uh, a difficult question for not within the church mm-hmm. but outside the church? Because, because again, that word change has broadened to mean that if you tell me that I must change, that you're taking away my rights. Mm. And, and there is some truth in that. You know, uh, there were some harmful modalities that were done through behavior modification, which was called conversion and mm-hmm. reparative therapy. Mm-hmm. And those were about change ministries. And then there are ex-gay ministries that are called change ministries, and they've been around and they've been abusive. You know, they've they've been focused so much on behavior. And and what let, are some of those modalities? Like for someone who may not know, absolutely, is, is it like shock treatments. Them? Okay, shock treatment. Okay. So what they'll do is they'll. So it's not conversion, like in the in the Bible spiritual correct. sense, right? But like, but just using psychological mm-hmm. forced behavior methods. modification, okay. and okay. and they range in these extremes. But again, if the if the focus is on changing behavior and if the behavior doesn't change, then that person is labeled, you know, a failure. And I think that in Christianity, it's still alive and well, because, you know, many times I get the question, are you dating? Are you married? Do you have children? So that's kind of the litmus test to know whether you've changed or not. When Jesus talks about the changing of the heart. Right. So this is the point that I want to make in that is that 
that now Christianity has been lumped into this label called conversion therapy. So conversion therapy has been stopped many years ago. I'd say almost 100 years ago, because they realized that it was causing a lot of suicides and it wasn't giving them the effective change. And then you were basically making these people, you know, just walking around like mummies because, yeah. you know, they've been lobotomized, yeah. you know. And not just for homosexual behavior, but really any behavior using those methods can be psychologically traumatizing. Right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. now what's happened is the gay community has has this label called conversion therapy. Mm -hmm. And imagine if you would, it's kind of like a dumpster that they put in the center of the room and they just put conversion therapy on it. So anything that doesn't go according to their affirmation theology or anything that questions that or challenges that or even says a change is possible it gets dumped right uh, into this this big bucket so mm -hmm. so conversion therapy is now kind of an ambiguous term because it means many things and it's always changing because anything that's that's outside of affirming and promoting gets labeled as conversion mm -hmm. therapy so coming out ministries has been as well as many other things christianity of course if you're a christian church or denomination that doesn't affirm and and promote this then you also get the label of conversion mm -hmm. therapy and get dumped into this dumpster but this is the beautiful thing about coming out ministries we're not about behavior modification. Mm -hmm. We're not here about dragging gay people and making them straight. And it's interesting because of the attack that we've gotten from the pro-gay Christian group that's within Adventism, you know, they're saying that we're conversion therapy. Well, it just gives us another opportunity to affirm that, no, we're not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I still have same-sex attraction, but God's given me the victory over acting on those things for the last 12 years, but he didn't take away my history and my memory. And then in that process of surrendering the thoughts and the feelings and the history and the memory of what I've had in 20 years, I've now had attractions to the opposite sex. So so I can't sit there and say that God just waves a magic wand and makes gay people straight. But I do understand the process that even Paul, when he said, you know, uh, take away this thorn of the flesh. And it's interesting to me because, I, I, you know, theologically, I may be speaking out of term, Justin, you might want to help me on this. But it's interesting because he says, why is it that I do the things that I don't want to do and I don't do the things that I want to do? That's not a thorn in the flesh. That's not a problem with your eyesight. I believe that he was struggling with some type of sexual sin that was calling out his name through history and memory. But Jesus said, he said, my grace is sufficient, meaning my grace isn't just a merited favor. My grace isn't just a pat on the head and says, I love you, whether you're good or evil. My grace is the power to overcome sin because mm. I won that ability when I died on the cross and rose from the dead. Mm. So again, recognizing that grace is that when those thoughts and when those feelings and when the history rises up, Justin, as it does and as it probably will until the devil is no longer av available, I know that I now have the process. Wait a minute. Lord, your word says that I'm something so much more. My identity is no longer in the things that I used to do or the things that I have a history of and the memory of. My identity now is in Jesus Christ, that in him I'm a new creature. The old things have passed away, but that doesn't mean that the devil can't throw at mm -hmm. me these temptations to try to tempt me back into that life. So again... Which really, um, and forgive, forgive me for interrupting, but sounds like just a normal experience of sanctification. We all struggle with things, and sometimes you. they come back Thank you, again. Justin. Sometimes we have the victory over things we praise the Lord for. Some things through our choices and wrong choices that we make, we fall into the things that were of the past. And then right. through, uh, thankfully, we can say when we look back, like... I've, I've overcome a lot from my past. We can look towards the future of seeing what we can be like in Jesus. So if it sounds like a normal spiritual experience of sanctification, you. but even in Christian culture, we want to think that we've arrived or we want to think mm. that, you know, we don't talk about the fact that, you know, maybe you were addicted to porn for 20 People years. People expect and now you're the married. magic wand. That's right. Experience That's right. Happen in well, we want it. <laughs> I want it. Don't you? You know, wouldn't it be great if I was never tempted again? But if our savior was tempted until the final moments of his life on that cross, mm. Are we any better than him? Doesn't it make sense? It will probably be tempted by something for the rest of our lives, right? Yeah. And so understanding the difference between temptation and sin, just because I'm tempted by something doesn't mean that that's my identity. Mm -hmm. Again, and if my identity is... Say that again, part, say that again. Just because we're tempted doesn't mean it's part of our identity. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's not my identity Maybe because I'm tempted in that. That might be my history. Mm -hmm. Ah, I love this. There was a, mm -hmm. um, an ex-gay, his name was Cy Rogers, powerful, very first testimony that I ever heard. And he's an extremely effeminate um, man that was married and had children. He was living as transgender. The Lord converted him. And at first when I saw this man, I was disgusted. And I said, that's a converted homosexual. But as I listened to him, 
I heard the power of the Holy Spirit working through this man's life. And you know what? What it did is it gave me hope because I looked at that man and I thought, if God can help him, he can help me. Mm. And that gave me great courage. But he said this. He said, you know what? If you broke your leg, Justin, you know, a bad break, you might have to go to surgery. You might have a scar on your leg. Then you'd have to go to rehab and have to learn how to walk with crutches or whatever. And then maybe for the rest of your life, you'll walk with a limp. But that still, the limp is still a sign of healing meaning that there was healing that took place. And you may walk with that limp, and that might be, you know, uh, effeminate mannerisms, or maybe it'll be the history and the memory that you deal with. But the fact that you walk Mm. at all is still a sign of healing. Mm. And so I think that we as Christians, we look at people's limps and we think that they're still identifying it that way, or they still are struggling with that, when really the way that God sees it is he sees healing rather than the limp that that person is going through. Mm -hmm. Man, I just I, I I love talking with you. Uh, there's there, a couple things. Uh, if I, this is not part of the questions here, but one, it seems like your ministry and your team, you guys have have you guys are have two fronts, mm-hmm. right? You're 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 helping the church out. And you're helping society out too. I mean, it's that 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 MB dexterity has got to mm-hmm. be tough to 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 be on on both fronts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The second thing is the more that you describe the this 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 challenge, it just describes the the normal human experience. This is the Christian experience. That was what really affected us early on in our ministry. You know, people would come up to us and and they would say, even even Ted Wilson's wife, when she saw our documentary, she said, "You know what? I struggle with everything that these people struggle yeah. with." And she goes, "I was never gay. I never struggled with same sex attraction." But what you're talking about, what your ministry is really about is victory over sin, yeah. righteousness by faith. And, you know, even um, even a, a heavy-duty theologian came up and said, ah, oh, you know what, your present truth. And we're like, what? And they go, yeah, victory over sin. It's the same for everybody. And, and that was really beautiful because we didn't see it that way because of our history. We felt ostracized. Mm. We thought that we had something different. But even as we were just telling our story, guess what? We all have that in commonality. And I believe that that's when Revelation 18.4 really kind of kicked in for me is that, you know what? Hmm. We're all told to come out of for my people. We're all told to come out of the things that come natural to us. Sin comes natural to anybody. And so if I do the things that come natural, of course, it's going to be sin. And then when Jesus says that this is the behavior that I expect, of course, it's going to go against my flesh, just like against your flesh. But we're all told that that's our new direction. And because we love Jesus and because we recognize what he did for us, I want to be what he wants me to be. Hmm. But I can't do it on my own. And as I start to realize that that I don't have to be perfect to earn God's love, he says my strength is is made perfect perfect in your weakness, meaning he says, recognize the fact that on your own, these are the things that come natural to you and that I can help you from that moment that you recognize that you're weak. Mm -hmm. And that's been, I think, a a beautiful process for all of us. Amen. Amen. Mike, um, can I, can I even draw this out further? And, and, and we've talked a little bit about it, but, um, how can we in Adventism, kind of have these conversations. Um, what can you say to our leadership, to our, our educational institutions, to our even even uh, our executive officers of healthcare organizations, mm-hmm. uh, which are distinctively Seventh-day Adventist? Mm-hmm. We're not talking about broad Christianity, but within the Adventist world, um, how can we have these conversational points about victory over sin, about our theology, but also recognizing the the LGBT struggle and, and the personal experiences that they've had? Oof. I think that very slowly and unfortunately very late in the game hmm. is that there are leaderships that are starting to see that it isn't going away. You know, the leadership that we were um, talking to, you know, 13 years ago when we started was, you know, kind of dismissive to us or yeah. will you do your thing you know there was a, a failed um adventist ministry to homosexuals that failed miserably um many years ago and i think that that leadership is very afraid to embrace or to encourage this kind of thing because of the history of that and of course the the pro-gay you know christian group they use that a lot to basically describe us or or any other ministry um but i think that what we need to do is to put it in perspective again. And if leadership could put it in perspective that, you know what, there's an application to every aspect of our ministry in that group, 
And if we don't treat it as something that's anomaly or something that's, you know, different or selective and just put it back in its perspective, then then we can address it in a way that doesn't isolate it or celebrate it, Mm. but rather puts it back in perspective and say, well, it's just another one of the issues. Stand in line and let's (laughs) all get through this together. But the bigger issue that I think, Justin, in our leadership that we've really lacked is that we have gone so long with not having these difficult conversations and we don't have a direction. Hmm. And so now what we have is we have so many schools and institutions that are now promoting it Mm -hmm. and they're denying the truth from being told on campus. It doesn't have to be told by coming out ministries. There are plenty of people willing to talk about it, but we have universities that have a moratorium on the LGBT issue, Mm. but they have two gay affirming groups on their campus that are Mm. promoting it. Mm. As a matter of fact, let me give an example. There was a young girl that was actually, she went to uh, the student center and she said, I'm struggling with, you know, homosexuality. And so they gave her the uh, gay affirming group and then she found out about coming out ministries. So here she was going to both. So she's going to one group on the campus where she's being told, so what was that like to be in a relationship with a woman? What was it like to be held and to be loved? So what they're basically doing is grooming her to go down to this road Mm -hmm. and identify as a lesbian, which she's wanting to leave. But then she's also talking to coming out ministries where we're talking about you know, it's about Jesus Christ and, you know, talking about Jesus. And she said, so while in one group I'm being affirmed, but in the other group I'm finding that it's all about Jesus, you know, and she had to make a really difficult decision. And and what I find is really the biggest problem is that there's no continuity Hmm. in our denomination. And what's happening is we've become splintered because there are so many people, so many students, so many teachers, so many university professors, so many seminarians that are planting seeds in in these new pastors' minds that that God is okay with being gay. And, And even with the statement of being called a gay Christian, was actually being considered in our denomination, and they actually invited Coming Out Ministries, you know, to share with them. And we urge them, we strongly urge them, that the terminology of gay Christian is is completely against biblical understanding because my identity is in Christ alone. Mm. And so when you put a prefix on my identity in Christ that's a sin temptation, what are you doing to the identity in Christ? You know, I'm in Christ, and, you know, the life that I now live in this flesh, I live according to the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. So I don't identify by my sin temptation, which, of course, may be there, those thoughts and those feelings, but my identity now, my direction, my orientation is to become like Christ. Isn't that yours, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So so if I can identify in my sin temptations, then maybe you'd like to identify as an adulterating Christian or a Sabbath-breaking Christian mm. or a lying Christian— Herein is the problem. It's Christ alone, mm-hmm. and and I'm a I'm a Christian because He's my identity, and so I'm not going to drag this ball and chain of my history, my memory, my old identity, so that I can be justified. And again, I think that that's the problem in our leadership is that we don't have consistency, and we don't have leadership standing up and saying you've crossed the line and you've gone too far because we have conference presidents that have rejected coming out ministries because they're speaking at the camp meeting for the pro-gay Christian group that identifies as Adventists. You know, we have uh, churches now that and schools that are that are actually divided. There's a school that actually had to fire four of their teachers because coming out ministries mm-hmm. came and, and these teachers were telling the children something different than than what was biblical. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's not the only school that we've heard that from. Let me give you a perspective that I think hopefully will speak to the leadership in our church because, you know, we have lost precious ground because it's out of control now, the amount of influence that's coming into our denomination because we don't have leadership standing up and saying, this is the line in the sand and you can't cross this over. You know, if a pastor, if a conference president is into celebrating LGBT rights and acceptance, then you know what? They belong in a different denomination. But when you're telling parents that they don't have any work for them, or or a friend of mine uh, was living in Sweden, and he went to the church where the union office is, and he said, I've left the gay life. I'm now living for Jesus Christ. And they go, oh, no, it's not a problem. Bring your boyfriend. Come to church together. When you have leadership telling the person that it's okay to sin when they've already gotten the message to walk away from their sin, what are we doing? Who's responsible for those souls? Mm-hmm. I think that the um, experience that I had with the Freedom March was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had. You know, we have come for Fall Council. We've shown our movie, and it was 
it was really amazing to me that we saw such a um, such a diversity of opinions on that. Hmm. And here I was getting that from you know the leadership of the the church that I really hold dear that I that I find the truth in. But there was a um, there was that horrible atrocity of the Pulse Lounge shooting, you know, where the man came in and killed forty nine mm-hmm. uh, gay people right mm-hmm. in the gay bar. And so out of that, there were two individuals that came out of that bar. One of them was shot several times. He had to learn how to walk all over again. He was in ICU mm-hmm. for for many days, and and he had prayed a month before the shooting. He said, "Lord, I know that this isn't what you want for me. Help me. Mm. You know, I can't leave this right." And so as he was in rehab, learning to walk again, the Lord confronted him and said. I spared you. There were 49 people that were killed, and you would have been number 50. But because of your prayer and because of your parents' prayer, I'm giving you another opportunity. And he walked out of the gay culture, and the LGBT community dropped him like a hot potato. They wanted nothing to do with him because they don't ever want anyone to think that change is possible. So while he was a poster child for this atrocity, now his word, his name isn't even spoken. They mm. never bring him up or whatever because they don't want anyone to think that anyone can change. But what happened is he joined a ministry called the Freedom March. And we heard about this um, about this movement, and they were in Orlando, Florida, which was where I lived for the 23 years that I was living in the gay culture. And the Pulse shooting also happened in, in Orlando. So this meeting was happening just two miles away from the gay bar where the shooting was. Oh. And and there were over 500 people involved in this ministry. And they were all ex-gay. They were had all come out of their LGBTQ lives. And here we were marching around this lake. And we were talking to different people. And Coming Out Ministries was there with 12 individuals. And we're passing out copies of our movie, 150 copies of our movie. And we're giving out T-shirts. And we're having dialogues with people from multiple denominations. There were Protestants, evangelicals, there were Catholics, there were all kinds of multiple cultures and and religions that were all gathered together, 500 of us, saying that you can stand on the Word of God and come out of your LGBT Mm. lives. What was so amazing, for the first time in my life and in this ministry, that I was with people that were all united on the same purpose. Mm. And Justin, I can't even get that in my own church. That to me is the responsibility of the leadership. And it's not about throwing blame or throwing shade. It's about, listen, it's time to really pull up our bootstraps and we need to draw a line in the sand. And then we need to be very clear about that. We know that the church is really going to struggle according to the prophecies that are out there. And it's sad to me to think that this is the issue that's going to separate our church. But I believe that if leadership really starts to draw that line in the sand and to hold pastors and teachers and seminarians and professors accountable for the things that they're promoting. As a matter of fact, there's a conference president that, that recently put in the newsletter to his, to his conference um, a picture of his gay son and his gay partner with the daughter that they adopted, and yet nothing is being done. That, to me, is an atrocity. And and I think that that's unfair to us as members of the church because we're giving a mixed message. And so if the church isn't clear on the message that we're giving, then then what leg do we have to stand on? And, and that only makes our responsibility even more difficult to bring that message to people when they're being so divided because the church isn't making a stand. Mm. And it's not just about making a statement. It's about promoting the truth as it is, you know, opening up the universities to being able to talk about that, putting leadership in place that stands for the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. And there have been many people that have lost their jobs because they took that stand. So that, to me, I think is the challenge for our leadership. I don't know how they're going to do it, but I know that God can do it. Mm -hmm. What What are ways where, and this is the perennial challenge, how can we stand up? for truth, speak for truth, uh, at the same time, do it in a loving way. And this is not not only in terms of leadership, but I'm broadening out to um, the whole issue altogether. We as Christians, we, we, that, that seems to be the hardest thing. Yeah. Truth and love together. How? We can't. We just can't. We, we can't do it. Mm. And, you know, there were Sadducees and Pharisees, and there were the liberals and the, and the conservatives. Mm-hmm. And the problem was is that they didn't have the Holy Spirit guiding them. Mm. And I think that that's the only way that we can do it, Justin, is like on my own, I, I'm going to fail miserably. 
But I believe that Jesus walked that line so perfectly Mm. because he was constantly connected to the will of his father. And so he mixed truth and love together. Why was it that the woman at the well, why wasn't she disgusted? If you tell me the truth about my life and and tell me that I was married to five men and that I'm living with some guy that's not even my husband, by the way, what a contemporary theme. But that woman (laughs) didn't get offended, but because of the way that he said that in Mm. such love, Mm -hmm. that he told her the truth about herself, love and truth together. And, and that's what I think that we're really missing as well mm-hmm. as in leadership, but also in conversations mm-hmm. down to even the relationship between, you know, a parent, parent and, and a child. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Is that we cannot bring love and truth together unless we're connected to the Holy Spirit. I mean, we as human beings, we're so myopic. We, yep. we can just speak truth very well or we're loving, not in its ideal sense, but at the expense of, of truth that, that we lose both elements altogether. Or our love is conditional. Mm. Well, I love you as long as you do this, 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 and this. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what drives you know a lot of people away. Mm-hmm. Um, by the way, yeah. I think it would be good to also bring up the fact that, that we speak to people in our Christian vernacular, yeah, you know, your lifestyle's an abomination, you know, that's <laughs> a sin. And you know what? The secular society, that doesn't even matter to them. Mm. They don't even relate to that word other than the fact that they've heard that so much from the Christian community that psh, the wall instantly goes up. They did a, a survey in Chicago to atheists, mm. and they talked to these atheist people, and they had a microphone, and they said, what well, comes to your mind when I say Jesus Christ? You know, And they would answer. They would say, Jesus is loving, Jesus is fair, Jesus is unselfish. So they understand who Jesus is, even if you know, they don't acknowledge him, you know, as being God. But then they would ask the same people this question. They say, well, what comes to your mind when I say Christian? And they would say, unfair, yeah. unloving, yeah. unkind. And so they understand who we are exactly. And so unless we're really connected to the Holy Spirit, there's really nothing that I can say that is going to make a difference because it's all going to be based on my own thoughts and my own feelings and what I think is what they need to hear. And that is the biggest issue from, I believe, leadership on down to the parents, on down to anyone in the Mm -hmm. church that's trying to minister to somebody. You know, quit telling me what the truth is and demonstrate it to mm-hmm. me. And I think that that's as simple as, you know, neighbors. Maybe you're a Christian and you have a neighbor that's a gay couple. You know, how can you minister to them? Maybe mow a little bit extra of their yard, you know, when you're mowing your mm-hmm. yard. Make sure that you don't let the hedge overgrow so that you can't see them when they're coming home. You know, make them a loaf of bread mm-hmm. at Christmas time. you know, reach out to them. Invite them over to your house for dinner. So I want to talk about uh, a little bit about, as, as a church, as we all talk about victory over sin, as you have so wonderfully articulated, that there's a fear that if I talk about victory over sin, it that can gravitate towards condemnation of the individual, right? Mm-hmm. And so in the church, um, there we're almost kind of paralyzed. We can't talk about this issue. We can't talk about victory over overcoming uh, homosexuality because then it will mean it will be interpreted as condemnation. And if it's interpreted as condemnation, then it's going to re- result in in depression, in suicide. And so we don't want that to happen. We don't. We don't. We don't don't want that to happen for our young people on our on our universities, for our own kids, for et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we just accept. And that's better than the alternative. Romans chapter one and verse sixteen. It says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Mm. And you know what? It's like I was so cavalier. And, I, you know, we all know that verse or whatever. But I was actually studying with this guy. He was a medical doctor. He'd been married for 30 years, having a, an affair with a man for 30 for half that time or more. And he was convicted, you know, finally that he needed to come out of all that. And so one day we were talking on the phone and, and we were just, you know, I was using the concordance along with my Bible app that had the concordance on it. And we were talking about Romans chapter one, which is a very, you know, touchy Mm -hmm. chapter for, for anyone with identity issues. But, um, we got to that verse. And when I got to that verse and I said, for it is the power of God into salvation, I hit salvation and I looked at the concordance word and the value of that, and it says to rescue. Mm. Justin, I'm telling you, it hit me like a wrecking ball. It was like, are you kidding me? Wait a minute. This power of God into salvation means it's the power of what Jesus did on the cross so that I could be rescued. Mm. And it started to explode in my head as I started to realize that the gospel of Christ is not hate speech. It's like I need rescued. 
And, and you know what? I think that it has a very um, interesting application to even Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 1. But, but basically, as my friend and I were sitting there talking about it, it's not— you know, salvation isn't just to save me from my sins. It's really to rescue me from mm. the things that come natural to me, the things that, that are I'm being identified with and now being celebrated. So if I refuse his salvation, I refuse the rescue. And so if I need to be rescued, I'm in a very dangerous position. So so what I see the application in Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 1 is it talks about how there are seven women Mm -hmm. that want to take hold of one man Mm -hmm. and they said we'll eat our own food and we'll wear our own apparel but by your name yeah yeah Mm. to save us from reproach right Mm. meaning you know take the heat off of you know how we're living so it's interesting to me because you know (laughs) one of the things that i learned early on is that a woman represents a church so if you're using that that understanding here are seven churches I want to be a Christian church because I want to take the name of Christ, right? He's the groom. But these seven Christian churches, they said, we have two exceptions. We're going to eat our own bread, bread representing the Word of God. So what they're saying is we're going to interpret the Word of God to suit us. And you know what? That wedding garment, because seven seven brides need a wedding garment, right? And But they're refusing the wedding garment, which is the righteousness, the salvation of Jesus Christ, everything that Jesus did on the cross so that, so that we could be in the presence of God himself. They're saying, no, no, we don't want the wedding garment. We're going to wear our own apparel, and mm-hmm. we're going to interpret the word of God that suits us, but give us your name to save us from reproach. The problem with that is that these people are not saved. Mm-hmm. They're lost. Remember the gentleman that wasn't wearing the wedding garment, right, at the wedding feast? Mm -hmm. What happened to him? I forget the the terminology, but he was cast out into Mm -hmm. outer darkness or something like that. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Right, right, right. And and, and here's the part, that the Word of God is not hate speech. And now what's happening is the Christian um, organization that's within Adventism, they basically say that um, they say that when— when the woman is caught in adultery and she's brought before, you know, Jesus, and he says, um, where are your accusers? And he says, neither do I condemn you. They say that that's loving speech. But when he says, go and sin no more, that's they're bad. saying that even Jesus himself is using hate speech mm. against this community. Mm. And the problem is, is that when he says, go and sin no more, he's saying not only does this behavior hurt others, but it hurts yourself. And he says, stop doing this behavior. And I have the power and authority to give you victory over that if you struggle with that. So if we call Jesus' words hate speech, we've cut them off from the salvation, the rescuing. And I think that it's... Um, I'm not sure where it is, so I'm not going to say it. But there's a verse in the Bible that that something about the deceivableness because they love not the truth. Second Thessalonians, mm-hmm. love of the truth. Maybe it is. I just looked it up this okay. morning. But it, they didn't have a love of the truth. Therefore, the word of God has to be hate speech. Mm. And so that to me is so troublesome mm. because if we accept that and if we're just, you know— uh, if we compromise the word of God to make somebody feel comfortable or affirmed, then we do not have a love of the truth either. Mm-hmm. And how can we dare call God's word hate speech when he's really desperate to save us? And here, I think, is a capstone because Second Timothy— wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know where this stuff comes from, but in Second Timothy chapter 3, it talks about we're living at the end of time. Mm. Verse 1, this is a message for people living at the end of time, and it says— that there are going to be problems with relationships, you know, mothers and fathers and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And it goes on. And then it gets to verse five and it says, there's a group of people that have a form of godliness, says they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Mm -hmm. And then of course it says from such stay away. But wait a minute, when I give my presentation and I ask the congregation or the people that I'm talking to, after I've been talking about the salvation of Jesus Christ, after I've been talking about the power of what Jesus did on the cross and, and when he rose again, he brought salvation to all men, reconciliation from sin. And of course we know that the devil hates Jesus Christ and wants to destroy Jesus. But what if the devil could just reduce or boil down Jesus to where he was nothing more than just a nice guy? Mm -hmm. What if Jesus was a friendly, happy person that didn't have the power to give you victory Mm -hmm. over your sin? Because it says this group of people that have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. And I asked my my um, the community that I'm speaking to, I said, what is the power that they're denying? And they come up with such ambiguous terms, the Holy Spirit you know, the message of this or whatever. And it's so sad because even we as a church denomination, 
the answer is they've denied the power of what Jesus did on the cross. Mm. And if they deny the power of what Jesus did on the cross, then you have to accept sin because Jesus doesn't have the power to give me victory over my sin. Therefore, we have to accept and include not just LGBTQ, but also murderers and liars and and every other thing that's out there. And I believe that that's the end game and the message from the enemy is to just water down the message enough to make Jesus impotent. Hmm. Because after spending 23 years in the gay community and then coming out, the best image that I had of Jesus Christ in my mind was that, yeah, he was a nice guy, but he wasn't the son of God. Mm. And that's what's happening in our church, Mm -hmm. is that we are removing and reducing the power of Jesus Christ to give us victory over our sin. And that, to me, I believe is the devil's end game. And he's using this issue to really bring that about. That we've just become some kind of moral ideology, where Ellen White calls respectable conventionality. We just pretend to be good on the outside, but there's nothing changing inside of us, whether you're homosexual or not, or or whatever. Right. Just no change. And isn't it interesting that before, you know, the devil used this hate message to ostracize a group of people, but now he's using a message of love to continue to ostracize a group of people Hmm. and to cut them off from the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Change is for everybody, hmm. or it's for no one. Hmm. Powerful, man. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Hey, Mike, I want to say thank you for, for coming in. You're a super busy man, but you to come into our studio and to spend our time with, with me. And this was a super, super, super powerful conversation. Uh, I don't know how much time has passed, but uh, I just want to say thank you. Are you kidding? Thank you, Justin, for the opportunity to come and to really just speak openly. Yeah. No, I think we need, it's not only of, of, of what you said, but it's also how you say it mm. um, that, that I've learned from uh, th- this openness and, and, and to be um, winsome and loving mm. and friendly, but to attack the, the errors that are there in, in, in the thinking, in the ideological world, and they have just real world ramifications. And I just think you're just a, an awesome person. You have an awesome team in your ministry, and you got a, a variety of fronts. So our prayers are with you. I want to say you. a deep thanks. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Yeah. Amen.